I will turn things over to Dr. David Patterson and he will introduce Dr. Kerner. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this first in a series of three distinguished lectures by our distinguished faculty at the Ackerman Center at the, for Holocaust Studies at UT Dallas. Uh, our first speaker today is our, our most recent uh, addition to the faculty, Dr. Amy Kerner is a fellow of the Jacqueline and Michael Ward Professorship in Holocaust Studies. It's thanks to our very generous donors that we're able to, to bring in and, and to put on our faculty such uh, excellent scholars and teachers as Dr. Amy Kerner. Dr. Kerner specializes in the history of modern Europe and Latin America. She has a focus on the uh, link linguistic identities of immigrants and marginalized groups. And this is a very important and timely area, as you can imagine. Uh, she's working on a book now called Bridge to Nowhere, Yiddish in Argentina from Mass Migration to Dirty War. Uh, this too I mean, it plays a, a, a central role in the history of the Jews in uh, Argentina and South America. I, this is, I'm, I know, is sure to be a, a seminal work, an important work. It examines the local and transnational politics of Yiddish. Yes, there's politics of Yiddish in the 20th century in Buenos Aires. And an article from this project is forthcoming by Dr. Kerner in the Journal of uh, Jewish Social Studies under the title Varanis Negros y Prejones, 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 <laughs> The Racial Anxieties of Argentine Yiddish. Uh, so please join me to welcome Dr. Kerner. Her talk today is on Jewish and national memory of dictatorship in Latin America. Welcome, Dr. Dr. Kerner. Thank you for being here and thank you all. All blessings. Bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Patterson. Thanks for the introduction. Um, nice to see familiar faces a moment ago before cameras went off and familiar names. And um, to those of you I know and those I haven't met yet, thank you so much for coming today. And I'm happy to kick off the Ackerman Center's spring lecture series on uh, Jewish and national memories of Latin American dictatorships. So the itinerary in the next month will take us from Argentina to Mexico to Brazil. And I'm just going to mention uh, what those two upcoming talks are after this one. For those of you who are interested on April 14th, Dr. Gonzalez will be talking about state-sponsored violence in Mexico and Argentina. And on April 28th, Dr. Valente will talk about the Holocaust and dictatorship in Brazilian literature. So join us for those. They, they promise to be uh, a, an exciting continuation of our theme. And now I'm just going to share my screen and bring up my presentation for you here. All right. So today we start in Argentina. And I'm going to be talking about language and trauma, Yiddish in post-dictatorship Argentina. And focusing on the Jewish memory of the dirty war, which I'll explain in a moment, as it relates to the Yiddish language, which was the most widely shared ethnic language of Jewish immigrants to Argentina. And I wanna start broadly for a moment uh, with a more familiar context by thinking in terms of what Yiddish meant in different places around the world in the 1970s, which is the decade that I'm, I'm starting with here. So if we think about what Yiddish meant in the United States or in Israel in the 1970s, and here you see some images that may be familiar to you. We might think of the resurgence of folk culture and of the presence of Yiddish in popular culture. And here you can see a performance, a poster for a performance by the popular Yiddish comic duo 
Gidon and Schumacher, who established themselves in pre-World War II Poland and became famous after World War II in Israel. And their, their comedy routines were televised there in the 1970s. And another poster for the 1971 film version of Fiddler on the Roof, which many of you are probably familiar with. Of course, in addition to being a time of nostalgia and folk revival for Yiddish language, the 1970s are also a time of language loss, of vernacular loss and decline. And this is true globally throughout former centers of Yiddish culture. But the lightness and the comedy that you can see here, if we think of Gigan and Schumacher and Fiddler on the Roof, <clears throat> I want to suggest is quite different in the case of 1970s Argentina. And this is because from 1976 to 1982, a general's regime that called itself the Proceso de Reorganización Nacional, the Process for National Reorganization, or for short, the Proceso, came to power in a coup in 1976 and waged a war, a dirty war, on so-called subversive leftist groups. And the image you see kind of typical uh, patchwork of faces of individuals who were murdered or, quote, disappeared during those years. This war, also known by the euphemistic name of the Dirty War, but actually a, a state-led war on civilians, constituted a major national trauma for Argentina. It's a recent trauma, and it's one that's very much alive in national collective memory. So in the next half hour or so, I'll first give a little background on the Dirty War and specifically the Jewish Argentine experience of it. And I'll tell you about how Jewish Argentine attitudes toward the Yiddish language were shifting during those years. And what I want to propose is that Yiddish in Argentina today bears the imprint of this national trauma. And that's something that really sets Argentine Yiddish apart from the fate of the language in other places. In many ways, the collective memory of the Proceso or the dictatorship of 1970s has been characterized by silences. After a March 1976 coup brought the military to power, the generals announced their intention to bring Argentina back to Christian civilization. They cleared urban slums, they reorganized universities and imposed censorship, and they waged a war on civilians, especially politically active youth who were monitored, arrested, and tortured. People spoke of, quote, disappearances or the desaparecidos, but knowledge of the scale of the murders at the time was limited. Official estimates today range from 10 to 15,000 to 30,000 people murdered. And what you see here is an image of the obelisk, which is a Buenos Aires landmark, bearing the regime's public health campaign message Silencio es salud, silence is health, which was part of a, a public health campaign, but at the same time was and is understood as a warning to citizens not to criticize the regime. The sign is no, no longer up, but um, it is remembered. Today, some sites of imprisonment and torture have become museums, memorials, and archives. I visited this one, the ESMA, the Escuela de Mec de la Armada or the Navy Mechanics School on my last research trip to Argentina. It's in central Buenos Aires. And the tour that I went on there was led by a former inmate who talked about his memories of being there, his experience of torture in this place. And while he was exploring his memories, other people that were on the tour were also sharing their stories and memories. One woman spoke about knowing that they needed to dig a hole and bury the Marxist pamphlets in their possession in order to not be at risk of arrest and detention. But at the time, she didn't really understand the scale of the violence or what exactly the threat was she might come under if she were caught with these materials. In other words, uh, the kinds of conversations that are still happening uh, between tour guides and tour groups in places like these are an act of reconstruction and an, an ongoing attempt to come to terms with and really understand the legacy of the Dirty War. The ESMA was probably the most notorious clandestine detention center operating during the dictatorship. And it was part 
their network of detention, torture, and extermination centers. And you can see here a map of the so-called camp circuit, which was named for Ramon Camps, the chief of police of the province of Buenos Aires. So you can see um, Buenos Aires here, this, this white patch, and prisoners were moved among these centers. In 11 and 12, a public trial took place in Buenos Aires in which some 400 testimonies were publicly presented. So you could go and sit in and listen to these. The result was 23 convictions, including a civilian official, which was historic. And the trial was historic for another reason too. And that is it was the most definitive statement to date characterizing the crimes of the dictatorship specifically as genocide. So in other words, this is extremely recent history in Argentina. It has very real and present legacies of trauma. The work of sorting through that collective memory of the dirty war is ongoing. And that's also true for Jewish Argentines who made up a disproportionately large number of victims of the Proceso. Jewish Argentines made up about 1% of the national population of Argentina at the time and about 10% of the victims of the Proceso. And this is a photo of Jorge telling students about his sister, Susana, who was born in 1958 and disappeared in 1976. She was arrested in her home in Tigre and nothing more is known about what happened to her afterwards. So Jorge here makes a classroom visit. He talks about her life, her intentions to become a teacher when she was young, how devoted she was to um, activism in poor slums and literacy campaigns in the years leading up to her disappearance. And his classroom visits show his devotion to his sister's memory and also the fact that for, for many Jewish Argentines, these experiences remain fundamentally unresolved. So why were Jewish Argentine youth disproportionately targeted by the Proceso? Well, an influential narrative emerged at the time during the dictatorship comparing the Proceso to Nazi Germany in terms of anti-Semitism and persecution of Jews. Uh, there's a lot to say about this, but, but briefly, uh, it's now generally agreed on the one hand that Jewish Argentines did receive worse treatment on average, including ridicule and torture with specifically anti-Jewish content. And it's also true that anti-Semitism and belief in a Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy were revived in the 1960s and 70s, and they circulated, especially in far-right military circles, uh, and are an important piece of the ideological background to the dirty war. At the same time, it's generally agreed by scholars that Jewish Argentines were not arrested as Jews or because they were Jewish. Uh, so why were Jewish Argentine youth disproportionately represented? Well, uh, they tended to belong to the middle class, so they were well represented among students, and university students were a major target of the regime for their leftism and political activism, interest in revolutionary activities. Uh, Jewish Argentine youth were drawn to revolutionary movements in contrast to the universalism and the socialism of the old left, which many of their immigrant parents had been drawn to. The new left was inspired by the Cuban revolution and it looked to merge nationalism with revolutionary popular movements. So we can see the commitment here in an image from a notebook kept by Jaime Shalubsky, who in the 1950s and 60s was involved with Yiddish cultural activities because he spoke the language, his parents were immigrants. But by the 1960s, he was totally absorbed with the cult of Che Guevara and his revolutionary ideas. And it's entirely possible and it's plausible, I think, that the social networks of many Jewish Argentine youth who did have immigrants exposed them to socialist and communist circles and conditioned their turn from the old left to the new left and set them on a path, so to speak, toward utopian revolutionary projects in the 1960s and 70s. So now after that detour into the history of the dirty war and the Jewish experience or Jewish Argentine experience of it, I want to come back to the question of the Yiddish language. Most of these Jewish Argentine youth in the 1960s and 70s rejected Yiddish as the stigmatized language of an immigrant past in favor of more exciting Latin American revolutionary projects, 
This was true in spite of the fact that many of them did grow up in Yiddish speaking homes and had intimate familiarity with and exposure to the language, even if they didn't learn to speak it fluently themselves. And we can see this anti-Yiddish attitude in contemporary testimonies and memories of growing up Jewish in Argentina in the 1960s and 70s. So here is writer Tamara Kamenschein. She was one of, one of many who left Argentina during the Dirty War. She took refuge in Mexico and her memories from the 1950s and 60s of the language spoken by her parents are in some respects pretty typical. Um, and I'll show you a, a quote and read this in just a moment. Uh, this is from a 2003 interview with Kamenschein. I knew that Yiddish was a language. Yiddish at that time was just getting started and it wasn't as important as it is now. This is 2003 with a whole revival happening. Yiddish was a language that made you ashamed, made you ashamed because its pronunciation was very ostentatious. I remember having had an attitude of distance and I would say, oh, how many years have they been here and they don't know how to speak. I, they don't know how to speak Spanish. And later she says, life turned around on me. It put me in a similar position living 20 years in Paris and I have an accent. In other words, she moved to France she with a Spanish accent. In the testimonies and oral histories that I've been working through by Jewish Argentines who were student aged like Kamenschein was in the 1960s, this sense of shame around the language is one of the most remarked on things. And that sense of shame has roots in a longer history of language nationalism, Spanish language nationalism and language based marking of immigrant difference in Argentina. So for example, here, you can see a cartoon that was published in the far-right nationalist magazine Cabildo in the early 1940s. And it shows a caricature of a Jewish immigrant in Argentina that also parodies his speech. So you can see he's meant to be a peddler in the city walking around with his wares. And he's talking, judging by the caption right underneath here, in what readers would have recognized as a Yiddish inflected Spanish which is mainly a matter here of taking the E vowels and substituting them with I vowels. So this excerpt here, instead of saying, uh, who, who says that tomorrow I won't become president of Argentina, which in a Argentine Spanish would be, quien te dice que mañana no llega a presidente de la Argentina? He's saying, quien te dice que mañana no llega a presidente de la Argentina? So you can hear the sort of uh, Yiddish behind his Spanish. And this is a stereotype Yiddish Spanish speech that would have been recognizable to readers of this far right nationalist publication. Even into the 1970s, this is in 1941, but a few decades later, when Jewish Argentines spoke Spanish and the majority of Jew Jewish Argentine youth did not speak any Yiddish at all, still parodies of Yiddish like this one did continue to circulate. So to give one example, in 1974, El Caudillo parodied the speech of Jacobo Timerman, who was a prominent journalist and literary figure, and he was a co-founder of the popular newspaper La Opinion. Uh, Timerman had grown up in a Jewish immigrant home. His parents actually brought him when he was a very young boy from Europe. Um, and he spoke a totally fluent and idiomatic Argentine Spanish from childhood. But in the cartoon uh, published in El Caudillo, he is speaking the same kind of half Yiddish, half or Yiddish inflected Spanish. So it included him saying, for example, Están Michiganes and no puedo she, no me alcanza platita. Uh, are you crazy? Instead of Están, Están Michiganes, I can't, buddy, I don't have enough money. And a similar kind of uh, vowel replacement is going on here that signals to the readers that this is a Yiddishized Spanish, that there's something faulty in the way he speaks Spanish. Timmerman would be arrested a few years later in connection with a purported money laundering scandal. And it was his prison memoir, Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number, you may have heard of this book, that would become one of the most well-known indictments outside Argentina of the human rights abuses of the regime. But 
I want to point out that the presence of Yiddish in the 1970s was not limited strictly to this kind of anti-Jewish caricature. Last summer, I came across this letter in the US National Security Archive. Uh, it says here, letter written in Hebrew at the top. That's an error. It's written in Yiddish. It was written in 1979 by a Bessarabian Jewish immigrant, Felix Katowski in Argentina, describing the disappearance of his son, Hector Katowski, two years earlier. In the letter, Felix, the father, says that he is writing in Yiddish in part because he believes it's more likely to get this letter around the censor, interestingly. So he's using Yiddish as a strategy to get the letter out of Argentina. He gave this letter to uh, a photojournalist who was visiting Argentina from California, who in turn sent this letter along with a tranche of Spanish to President Carter in an effort to bring awareness to human rights abuses in Argentina. And here is the son, Hector Katowski, and a poem in his memory in Spanish, along with a photograph of him, which is labeled in Yiddish, not Hector Katowski, but Herschel Katowski, what, as he would have been called in Yiddish in his, in his home by his father, probably. And I found, I found the letter, first of all, striking and surprising. I wonder if other such letters exist. Um, and I find both the, the letter by the father, Felix, and the photograph with its handwritten inscription here of Herschel Katowski's name in Yiddish quite moving as documents that show how the Yiddish language continued to mediate both the experience and the memory of the human rights abuses of the dictatorship and of the disappearances. I want to turn now to a few more examples of the way Yiddish features in the memory of the dictatorship. So turning to the end of the dictatorship, which unraveled when Argentina lost the Malvinas Islands in the Falkland Island War in 1982 with a transition to democracy in 1983. And so I wanna turn now to the memory of Yiddish and the reemergence of Yiddish in Spanish language Argentine culture after 1982-83. I mentioned a few moments ago the prison memoir by Jacobo Timmerman that drew attention to the crimes of the Proceso. Timmerman wrote the book in Spanish. He published it when he was living in Israel in 1980. He lived in Israel after he was released from prison and stripped of his citizenship. And this book is an early example of a post broader post-dictatorship phenomenon, namely the appearance in memoirs and in semi-fictional semi accounts of detention and torture that incorporate memories of Yiddish. So Yiddish comes up in the context of these semi-fictional accounts of dis and, and imprisonment. In other words, what I'm talking about here is the reemergence of Yiddish into Spanish language cultural production in Argentina, closely connected to the working through of the traumatic experience of the Proceso. So I'm going to show you a passage from Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number, um, but I just want to introduce it by saying that in the memoir, in the prison memoir, the passage appears immediately following a scene of interrogation. Timmerman is being interrogated. And his questioners during the interrogation are forcing Timmerman's memory further and further back into his childhood. They're not satisfied with, with his answers to their questions about his adult activities. They want to know they're suspicious about his Jewish background. They wanna know more and more about what he did as a young man, as a school child. Until eventually he recalls how his mother never mastered Spanish and how he was mortified by her continuing use of Yiddish. And he writes, the year is 1933, five years after our arrival from Russia. My mother says we're newcomers in Argentina, greenhorns, but I don't feel like a newcomer. She talks to me in Yiddish, and I teach her Spanish. She learns, but goes on talking to me in Yiddish and calling me Yankala. She mortifies me everywhere. But the Spanish translation also makes people laugh. Jacobo is very Jewish. Other more recent examples by Jewish Argentine writers seem to sort of follow this model that is apparent in, in Timmerman's memoir, 
by bringing memories of Yiddish from childhood into semi-fictional accounts of disappearance. The writer Sergio Chefetz, you can see here, he's the one with the coffee cup in front of him, wrote about the disappearance of a close childhood friend of his in the novel Los Planetas, The Planets, which was published in 1999. This is a novel that's a patchwork of memories of his friendship, along with the narrator's growing awareness that the disappearance probably means his friend has been murdered and will never reappear. Kind of gradual dawning on the narrator about the meaning of the disappearance as a murder in the context of this state-led war. And the narrator of the novel is called S, a thinly disguised Sergio. So in the story, the narrator S remembers going to his friend's home and meeting his friend's parents who are Jewish and the narrator is disturbed because the parents speak a perfect Spanish, totally without any Yiddish accent. And S, the narrator, is going to rely on that Yiddish accent as a way of orienting himself to who is and who is not Jewish and to recognizing somebody with a Jewish immigrant background. So he writes in Los Planetas, in the lack of an accent in M's family, I saw the sign of a diffuse danger that never failed to manifest itself in anything or anyone in particular, a threat at worst or an equivocation at best, the abolition of differences with the world. So you can see that when Yiddish does emerge in these kinds of stories and semi-fictional accounts, it is accompanied by uh, a kind of aura of danger or uh, shame or embarrassment or uh, mystery that has everything to do with the affective landscape of the disappearances and of life as it was unfolding during this very dangerous time. Another writer, Nora Strechilevich, was herself arrested in July 1977. And her book, Una Sola Muerte Numerosa, One Single Numerous Death, incorporates her own experience of detention and torture along with the story of her brother's disappearance, her brother Gerardo. And she also incorporates excerpts from documents, reports, and testimonies of the dictatorship years. So it's a kind of cut up of um, autobiographical and documentary materials. And here too, in Una Sola Muerte Numerosa, the memory of Yiddish and of its loss from one generation to the next appears in connection with the disappearances. She starts out in a passage uh, talking about her brother's clandestine existence in the city, hiding in a, in a crummy flat in the center of the city, hoping not to be arrested because he's involved in leftist activities. And she compares his existence to the precarious life of her immigrant grandfather when he moved to the city uh, in the early 20th. And she tries to imagine what her grandfather's life was like, including his relationship to Yiddish. And so in the following passage, she's uh, imagining a conversation that she might have had but didn't have with her grandfather. And again, this is embedded in a section that begins with her brother's clandestine existence, and it ends with a description of Nora's, her own torture in a det detention center. So in this fantasy conversation with her grandfather, she asks him, do you eat koilech bread, pletzelech, bagelech? Do you Yiddish, a sweet language baked in music, or a mix of Yiddish with a dash of flavor? Who knows? Some arbitrary day you die and they bury your aspirated H's and staccato J's beneath tombstones in Hebrew that I never saw. And here it's worth noting that these obviously these aspirated H's and staccato J's are describing both the sound of Yiddish and specifically the sound of Yiddish to the ear in Spanish or the way Yiddish would have been um, inflected through Spanish spoken by an immigrant. Likewise, her reference to burying the Yiddish speech beneath tombstones in Hebrew loosely refers to something that also historically is true, which is that, for example, Yiddish writers, Yiddish journalists in Argentina who died in the 1960s were buried and had tombstones inscribed in Hebrew, not in Yiddish, now, this was something that I've seen reports of in the Yiddish press, which was sometimes really offensive and unpleasant to readers of the Yiddish newspapers who couldn't understand why these tombstones were in Hebrew rather than Yiddish when the writer actually wrote in Yiddish during their years of activity in Argentina. 
So now I want to come back to the question of how Argentine Jewish memory has dealt with the legacy of Yiddish since the dictatorship and how this legacy sets Argentine memories of Yiddish apart from memories of Yiddish in other places. The entanglement of, with the trauma of the last dictatorship is a major factor in contemporary attitudes toward Yiddish in Argentina. And this really makes for a jarring contrast to the trajectory of Yiddish outside Latin America, if we come back to that. So to return to the examples of Israel and the United States where we started, if comedy and nostalgia have often characterized Yiddish elsewhere since the 1970s, in Argentina, the resurgence of interest in Yiddish has taken a very different path. Namely, the language appears in Spanish language cultural production with an aura of trauma that has first and foremost to do with the most recent national tragedy of the Dirty War. And I just wanna share a few more thoughts here by way of conclusion. And I'll come back to this um, stirring image, I think, of Katowski. We tend to think of Yiddish, of the legacy of Yiddish, primarily in connection with the destruction of Jewish life in Europe in the Holocaust. This is in indeed an important turning point in the history of Argentine Yiddish. After 1945, Yiddish became a language of commemoration and memorialization in Argentina. Yiddish book publishing in Buenos Aires after 1945 also expanded considerably including the publication of many Yisker, Yisker Becher memorial books to destroyed Jewish towns in Europe. And there were a lot of, in the context of Jewish Argentine institutions, there were new cultural programs and projects, um, and didactic projects, especially for aimed at children, developed in an effort to sustain Yiddish after the loss of European Yiddish, uh, of the European Yiddish cultural center, so to speak. The rejection of Yiddish in the 1960s and 70s that I've talked about and the renewed interest in it after 1983 shows us how the uses and meanings continued to change throughout the decades following the Holocaust, during and after the Proceso. For second and third generation Argentines, the Holocaust was a matter of family history and it belonged to their parents and their grandparents lived experience, but not their own. The Proceso and the dictatorship, by contrast, was a firsthand experience of theirs, and it was one that was shared by multiple generations. So as we saw, the Yiddish language did continue to speak as a vernacular, for example, Felix Katowski's letter were being spoken in private spaces in homes, and also as a stigmatized caricature that younger people were ashamed of, well into the 1970s and 80s. And for that reason, it has become a part of the collective working through of the Jewish Argentine experience of the dictatorship. Today, the meanings of Yiddish are entangled not only with the losses of the Holocaust, but also with the more recent experience and memory of the Dirty War. And because the political and social legacy of the dictatorship remains in many ways open and unresolved, the contemporary status of Yiddish too remains bound up with that national trauma. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. Hello. So I thank you very much. I did my little virtual applause and I see a lot of other people have. Um, we've got, let's see, we still have uh, some people it looks like are typing into the chat now. So if you've got any comments or, um, or any questions, please feel free to go ahead and put those, those in the chat. Um, while we wait for that, I do have a question. Um, I know that, I think we've talked about this before, but last semester we did screen a show called The Silence of Other that talked about the, this theme of, of silence, just like you did with that early on with um, that sign. And do you think that there is, that trying to atone for their own sins and everything that they did um, 
as the, the Argentinians, that that's one of the reasons that it was only an Argentinian judge that was willing to take on the trial for the, the Franco regime and some of the perpetrators for the disappeared from, from then? Uh, well, I, I certainly think that the, the legacy of the dictatorship in Argentina and all of the work that has been done uh, to try and uh, accomplish justice in various forms has been tremendously influential. So um, the members of the audience may or may not have seen this, this film, The Silence of Others, which was a fantastic uh, recent documentary that goes through details, the kinds of um, transnational legal connections uh, between Spain and Argentina in uh, the effort to find justice for victims of the Franco regime in Spain, going back to the Civil War of the 1930s. And there it became very important that, um, that Argentina had a kind of model and that it was possible to start certain uh, legal processes to bring actors in the Franco years to justice from Argentina rather than inside Spain where there was a, a robust uh, infrastructure to prevent those struggles from happening. Um, so on the one hand, Argentina has been uh, fundamental there and instrumental in allowing that process to advance in some ways for Spain and at the same time, in, you know, both for Spain and for Argentina, that process has been a very fraught one. So Argentina too has um, experienced a kind of one step forward, two steps back over the years since 1983, in which um, attempts to organize and, and uh, ca carry out trials and public hearings have on the one hand been extremely important and family organizations of families of the disappeared have done a lot of work to get uh, public records, testimonies to, to bring to light a lot of information about the crimes of the dictatorship. And yet there have also been um, governments that have passed impunity laws or attempts to tear down centers like the ESMA so that they would be removed from uh, public memory. Yes, I think Argentina has been uh, a, a leader in many respects and also um, unfortunately, uh, is an example of how difficult these struggles are, both in Argentina and elsewhere in places like Spain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we do have some questions now. Uh, has Yiddish reemerged then in Argentina? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, on the one hand, you know, you can look kind of globally and say there's been a revival, a resurgence of interest in Yiddish in many places since the 1970s, one way of thinking about this is just a kind of generational logic to say, you know, the, the children turn away from the immigrant language and pass, and then the grandchildren have enough distance that they kind of become re, reinterested in it again. Um, but, but part of my, my argument here is that uh, we also have to look at very specific national and regional contexts in order to understand why that kind of interest would come up. In Argentina, in, in answer to the question in Buenos Aires, the, the kind of revival of Yiddish is pretty limited, uh, especially if we compare it to the United States. On the one hand, there is some presence in popular culture of uh, Jewish comedy that, that also involves Yiddish. However, um, I think that uh, that's a, a real marginal and fringe phenomenon compared to what I see as the major effective uh, experience attitude toward Yiddish, which as I've described is more a traumatic one, especially when we look at the experiences of Jewish Argentines. But there certainly is now a presence of Yiddish in Spanish language publications, as in some of the examples I showed there are um, at the EVO, the Yiddish Scientific Institute in Buenos Aires, there are circles uh, where you can go and practice the language or learn it. Uh, so it has a certain kind of status now that it certainly didn't have in the 1960s at a time when the main uh, keepers of the language were the native speaking immigrant generation who was, you know, really looked at askance as not fully Argentine if they did not speak perfect Spanish and even if they did were sometimes uh, caricatured as Yiddish speakers. So I would say the fact that 
these uh, second and third generation writers are now really incorporating Yiddish in ways that are um, emotionally productive for the working through of this experience of trauma is a kind of example of a resurgence of Yiddish. Um, on the heels of that, Dr. Harpum is asking whether or not many Yiddish speaking Argentines have moved either to Israel or the US since the dirty war as Timmerman did. Um, just reading the question again. Yes, there, there was a, um, so on the subject of Yiddish speakers in Argentina and specifically following in, in Timmerman's footsteps for going to Israel. And one answer is yes, there was uh, quite a large emigration from Argentina related to the political oil of the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, not only of Jewish Argentines, but just generally speaking, a lot of Argentines left. It became a country of emigration in the late 20th century. And so part of that was lar fairly large numbers of, and I, I, can't I won't quote you a number so that I'm not mistaken here, but um, many people did leave either temporarily and returned or, um, or permanently. And Israel was one of the destinations. I think France was another a popular destination for Argentines who left at the time. Uh, and one thing that's really noticeable now in the, the relatively small world of Yiddish studies is that quite a few prominent Yiddishists, including Itzhak Miborski, who works um, as a teacher and linguist of Yiddish in Paris, um, uh, Avram Noverstern and Esther Rojansky, who are both in Israel some leading figures who appear again and again as teachers at some of these annual Yiddish language schools and institutes for students who today in generation are interested in studying the language. Many of them come from Argentina because there was such a strong infrastructure in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, until the, the moment that I'm talking about here for learning and studying the language in a really rigorous way. Um, so not only other Yiddish speakers leave some of them to Israel, some of them to United States or to Europe like Timmerman, but um, there, there's a, a cohort of them, a strong contingent who have remained fairly influential uh, in, the, in the world of Yiddishists. Um, along that vein a bit, the, do, are you aware of whether or not there's any Yiddish language courses that are taught uh, there in Argentina in the schools and universities, if that's becoming an offering? It's a really, it's an interesting point of comparison with, again, with other um, national educational cultures, this question of whether Jewish studies or Yiddish studies exists within the, uh, the, the university landscape or the higher education landscape. Um, it, if that exists today, and I, I think I, it's still kind of an open question how established that is. It's a, it's a fairly late development if you compare it to obviously Israel, the United States, Columbia University had a Yiddish language program that was fairly prominent for a while, which I don't think exists anymore. Um, now it's part of history or Jewish studies. Um, but in, in Argentina, when Yiddish was taught, it was taught within the Jewish school system. And then in the, in the 1920s, when immigrant networks were really building institutions in Buenos Aires that resembled the, the Jewish and the Yiddish cultural lands, institutional landscape in Poland, uh, when Buenos Aires was sort of, there was a little Warsaw in Buenos Aires, um, Yiddish was taught in those schools and many Jewish parents sent their children to those schools. And that's, that school network kind of, it, it still exists, but the linguistic side of it changed dramatically in the 1950s or so. Gradually Yiddish was replaced with Hebrew. The language of instruction was Spanish. So today you wouldn't find a lot of Yiddish being taught in the Jewish schools. They are just Spanish language Jewish schools with religious or other Jewish content. Um, and if you wanted to take a course in Yiddish, you could likely find one by going to one of these institutions like the Yiddish Scientific Institute or the EVO. So there is a continuing, uh, uh, a separation 
uh, institutionally in terms of where Yiddish is actually taught or where, where you go. There's a, a nucleus for Jewish studies that's very active, um, but it is not, uh, it doesn't sit within a Jewish studies or Yiddish studies program at a university. So that's kind of a, a difference in the way the, the educational landscape is set up and the way Yiddish is situated in it in Argentina. Thank you. Um, another question is asking whether or not you're aware if the Argentinian attitude towards Yiddish speaking immigrants may have reflected a general attitude towards immigrants who speak other languages or other dialects of Spanish, or do you believe that that was specific to Jews and Yiddish speakers? That is a great question, and that is something that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about right now, um, because I think it's very important to ask the question, how unique is the, the Jewish immigrant experience here in the broader context of race and ethnicity in 20th century Argentina? Um, and so I think there, there are arguments to be made on in, in both ways in answer to this question. Uh, no, I don't think that language discrimination directed toward Yiddish was in any sense entirely unique. Um, and I mentioned that the, uh, the, the history of marking immigrant difference linguistically was something that goes back to uh, a deeper history of Spanish language nationalism in Argentina. So um, there, there's some, some uh, scholarship on cultural, cultural nationalism and language nationalism in Argentina and language being a really important factor in the development of um, of nationalism as it emerged in the state building period in the late 19th century. So um, literacy and spreading Spanish language literacy was a major goal of the state. And in part, that was a response to the mass migration of non-Spanish speakers from Europe, including uh, not only Jews who spoke not just Yiddish, obviously, but also Polish, uh, Italian, a lot of Italian immigrants such that Argentine Spanish is musical and inflected by the, the Italian language and the influence of all of those Italian immigrants who came in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and then also speakers of Chinese, of Japanese, of Korean and smaller numbers. But um, all of this was something that was disturbing to liberal statesmen um, and nationalists early on. And, uh, really fueled their drive to make Spanish language instruction and literacy absolutely central to the state building process. So I don't think that Jews are unique in that respect. I do think that there is um, something really interesting going on with the Jewish experience, which is that uh, from, from their own perspective as uh, immigrants from Europe who came at a time when uh, Jewish nationalism was uh, in a process of flux, linguistic identity was somewhat unstable. In other words, there were Jewish nationalists who wanted Hebrew to be the, the language of Jewish nationalism, others who saw Yiddish as the language of Jewish nationalism, others who were deeply attached to German. Um, there, there's, there's something going on where Yiddish is, is both being used to mark Jewish immigrants and to marginalize them or to see them as outsiders to Argentina, while at the same time, uh, there's a lot of pride among Jewish immigrants in Yiddish in its status as a European language. And in a sense, it's partaking in a certain kind of uh, European cultural imperialism where uh, Jewish immigrants can see themselves as Yiddish speakers in a way elevated in a racial hierarchy above speakers of other non-Spanish languages. So that, that's something that, that I have written about and that that will be, some of those arguments will appear in the article that Dr. Patterson mentioned, the racial anxieties of Argentine Yiddish. Oh, excellent. So thanks for that question. Excellent, that's a nice tie-in. Um, one last comment or request from the, the chat is asking whether or not you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit about your personal connection and exposure to Yiddish. Okay, I'll be right there, I'm watching. Okay, Biden's nope. giving a speech. What? Biden's giving a speech. There sure. you go. Um, well, I came to Yiddish rather late. I came to Yiddish in graduate school and I studied at the Yiddish Scientific Institute in Vivo uh, with a number of teachers, one of whom had grown up in Argentina. And I remember at the time noticing, kind of asking myself and noticing that there was something 
Spanish sounding about the way that he spoke Yiddish and becoming a little bit interested at that point in what the intersections were here for multilingual speakers of Yiddish and, and in particular how the Argentine experience had conditioned the language. Um, but my first language is English. My second language was Spanish uh, and I studied German in college. So it was through German that I came to Yiddish because as you may or may not know, they're very close to each other. Uh, it's my, my gateway into Yiddish linguistically. Uh, otherwise, intellectually, I came to Yiddish because I was studying the history of uh, nationalism in the uh, Central and Eastern European borderlands and the transitions from empires to nation states in the 19th and 20th centuries and was just fascinated by Yiddish as a case study of a language that was absolutely at the crossroads at the, at the borderlands um, in terms of its meanings and uh, how people saw speakers of Yiddish and how speakers of Yiddish saw themselves. And then this paradox of a language that was assassinated in the Holocaust where a large number of speakers were murdered and the language declined from there. And yet we have lots of materials in Yiddish and a long history of Yiddish that extends decades beyond the Holocaust and what that means and what that looked like. And that's what brought me to this current project of looking at Yiddish speaking immigrants going to Argentina and then asking, well, what happens to it outside Europe? What is its fate over the next decades? And in what ways do the uses and the meanings of Yiddish change and continue to change? What ways are they even today um, colored by recent experiences? Uh, that date back to before the Holocaust and, and the Holocaust is a crucial turning point, but also things like the processor or the dictatorship that have happened since. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, we are about out of time and we don't have anything else in the chat. So I think now is a good time for everyone to, to do their little virtual claps and to, and to say thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. I know it gave us a lot to think about. Um, I'd also like to invite everyone to please uh, tune in for the next in this series, it's going to be on the 14th at 4 p.m. Dr. Pedro Gonzalez Corona will be speaking. And then two weeks after that, Dr. Sarah Valente will be speaking. So um, I put a link in the chat if you want to, to see about all of our upcoming events, or you can just go to our website. But thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Kerner. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, I look forward to the other talks coming up next month. <laughs>